Again, kind of a review of anatomy a little bit. When we look at our muscles, our muscles are going to be organized in such a way to cooperate with your skeletal system. Muscles alone really aren't going to be much good. Bones, in and of themselves, they're not really going to do anything. But working together, bones and muscles can get a lot done. Bones are going to be attached to two places. One is called an origin, and in this case your biceps, the origin is on your scapula. And the insertion, in this case the biceps is going to be inserted on the radius, your forearm. The origin is the relatively fixed point relative to the other end, the more movable point. And I, I, I liken the analogy to, to moving a refrigerator. You are the muscle You've got an origin and an insertion. You hope your feet on the floor is the origin, right? Because have you ever tried to move a refrigerator on a linoleum floor with socks? What's going to move, the refrigerator or you? You're going to move. Your feet are just going to go back, okay? So in this case, when your biceps contracts, it's pulling in both directions. Well, what's going to move more easily, your forearm or your shoulder? Your forearm. So when your biceps contracts, you get an action. And in this case, the action of the biceps is to flex the forearm. In anatomy, you probably learned a lot of origins and actions and insertions of muscle and how they're attached to the body. The triceps, the antagonistic pair, its action is going to be to extend the forearm because it has different origin and a different insertion. All muscles do is contract. They shorten. It's the attachments to the bones that cause certain movements to occur. I'm going to ask you to look at muscles and their organization in a little bit of a different way than maybe what you look at in anatomy class. Muscles are very high maintenance cells. They're going to require a lot of ATP, a lot of energy. They're going to require a lot of maintenance and repair. Because when you use the muscles, especially with a lot of strenuous activity, you're going to be tearing down muscle fibers and building new muscle fibers to deal with that stress. Your muscles only have to shorten a certain distance. But the point of attachment between the origin and insertion might be quite extensive. And rather than extend muscle that entire length and have all of these high maintenance cells to have to take care of and worry about, your muscles actually are going to connect the origin and insertion through basically connected tissue. We call them tendons. And one of the best examples is your gastrocnemius. What's another name for gastrocnemius? Calf, your calf muscle. If you feel where, where your calf muscle stops, okay, your calf muscle is going to stop maybe about right here, halfway down your lower leg. Where is the insertion for the gastrocnemius? It's way down here on the bottom of your heel. Extending from about this point all the way down to the bottom of the heel is a very famous tendon, the Achilles tendon. Now, tendons are pure collagen fibers, parallel arranged cables, side by side by side, bundled together. There basically are no cells, no nerves, no blood vessels. It's just collagen. Collagen resists stretching. It has a tensile strength, which makes it really, really good for tying into the connected tissue of the bone. But here's, here's the new perspective I want you to have about muscles. I want you to think of tendons and the connective tissue that wraps the muscles. I want you to think of this organization. From the origin to the insertion. I want you to imagine this is a sleeve of collagen. One solid sleeve of collagen attaches to the origin, 
attaches to the insertion. Now, the reason I want you to think about that is because when you think of a chain, okay, what's the weakest part of a chain? The weakest link, right? And it's usually where you've made a joint or a repair. With this connected tissue, this collagen streaming from the origin to the insertion, there is no junction. There's no joint. Nothing's been stitched together. So now, think of a muscle like this. You've got this sleeve or tube of all this dense collagen extending from the origin to the insertion. Now, pack muscle cells inside of that. Don't attach a tendon to the muscle. That's a joint, right? That's a place that you could tear with the stress. What we're going to do is we're going to pack muscle inside this long stretch of collagen and pack it together so that when the muscle contracts, it's going to pull that collagen in with it. Now you're going to have a nice strong attachment, a contiguous attachment that's got the muscle that's the engine inside the chain. Does that make sense? But here's the thing. It's not that the muscle is big one, one big wad sitting inside this sheet of collagen. The muscle is interspersed between a lot of these collagen fibers, and it organizes it into three levels. Now, the collagen surrounding the muscle is still going to extend down past where the muscle stops as a tendon. It's going to extend up past where the muscle stops as a tendon. But I want you to appreciate that this collagen is streaming down through where we have the muscle cells, and the muscle cells are just interspersed with all the collagen. It's the collagen that makes it tough. The muscles just shorten it. All right, so that's what we're seeing here. Here's the tendon. The muscle has stopped. But this collagen, this tendinous material is going to extend up. And do you see how some of this material wraps around the whole muscle? Some of this material wraps around and bundles some of these cells into little groups. And some of this is going to wrap around each individual muscle cell. So do you see how this tendinous material is going to be all interwoven in and around and organize the muscle? Well, we have three different layers. The epimesium. Epi means surface or on top. Mesium is muscle. This is going to wrap the whole muscle. It's the outer covering. Some of that tissue is going to wrap these bundles of muscle cells into groups that we call fascicles. And that connective tissue that wraps the cells into fascicles is called the perimesium, or around the muscle. This is on the surface of the muscle. This is around the muscle, and particularly around the fascicles of muscle. And then lastly, we've got these that are wrapping each individual muscle cell on the inside. What do you think a good name for that would be? Inside. Endomesium. Wraps each muscle cell. And each muscle cell, another name for a muscle cell is muscle fiber. Because skeletal muscle are these nice long cables of cells. So that's how muscles and pulling on tendons and attaching the bones, that's how they can be so secure. You've got to do a lot of damage, have a lot of stress before you're really going to tear a ligament or a tendon. But we know as stupid people we can do that because we do a lot of crazy things. We get paid to do a lot of crazy things, right? NFL players, they're popping their ACL into your cruciate ligament all the time. Because you get a 500-pound defensive end jumping on your back, yeah, something's going to go. All right, so entire muscles, whole muscles, we can refer to as an organ. And they're going to be comprised not just of the connective tissue, but those muscle cells or muscle fibers that are wrapped by all that connective tissue. The epi, the peri, and the endomesium. This, again, is just another look showing that you've got this outer wrapping, you've got the fascicles, and then you've got that individual muscle cell on the inside that's being wrapped by the endomesium. Now, we already looked at how a nerve
signals a muscle and how that muscle can repropagate the action potential and send it all down the length of that muscle cell. And so when we look at muscles that have different sizes, that need to contract in different ways, how do we control that? Well, the control of muscle contraction is really because of these structures called a motor unit and how many different fibers actually attach and activate how many number of muscle cells. And so a motor unit is one motor neuron and all of the muscle fibers it actually connects with. You remember under that terminal button we had all those branches? The arbor vitae? Well those branches don't necessarily just have to go to one muscle cell. They can go and attach to different muscle cells. Axons can have collateral branches. So when we look at how many neurons go to the muscle and how many muscle cells those innervate, that is our motor unit. And remember, if that neuron fires, all of the muscle fibers it's attached to, they're going to fire too. So again, it's that all or none rule, much like we saw in the action potential. So here we have a, a motor neuron, and you can see that this is attaching to one, two, and three muscle cells in this region. Here you can see this motor neuron, it's, it's got a lot more attachments than just three. There's another motor neuron that's coming and attaching there. So, let's look at this. If you have muscles that have to do kind of large scale gross work, meaning supporting weight, it doesn't take a lot of fidelity to do that. All those muscle cells have to work together to do the one thing like your thigh muscles. They're, they're going to work for walking and running, but they're largely all going to fire at the same time. So you don't need a lot of control. you got one foreman that's telling a thousand workers what to do. But when you look at your eye muscles, the muscles that are controlling what direction your eyes look, you need a lot more fidelity, a lot more control of that action. So in this case, for every nerve, you're only activating 10 muscle fibers. You can also think of it like this. You have a lot more nerves controlling all the fibers of your eye muscle and fewer nerves controlling the legs. All right? Because the thigh muscles, they're going to contract and relax. Your eye muscles have to do various things to cause your eyes to move in different ways and different degrees of movement. How fast, how slow. So basically, the smaller the motor unit, the more precise the control of that particular organ, that particular structure. Larger number of fibers in a unit, the less control you really have, and the more kind of grossly uh, that work's going to get done. So here we have one nerve going to one fiber, or one nerve going to five or six. All right, a lot more control going on there. Now, I mentioned the thigh muscle, 1,000 muscle fibers per neuron. Now, for me, just walking around and standing here, I'm not really using all of the muscle fibers in that thigh muscle, the quadriceps muscle, because I don't need to. But if I went into the wellness center or if I went into... Um, the rec center, and I got on a squat rack, and I put, you know, 200 pounds on that squat rack. Well, as I carried the burden of that extra weight, and I went down and started to try to lift that weight, initially, a small number of motor units are going to be activated. They're going to say, oh, we got a little bit more than we're used to carrying around here. So let's get more help. So they're going to recruit more motor fibers to start contracting to see if we can lift the weight. If you get to the point 
in doing squats or some kind of exercise like that, where you have got the weight on your shoulders and the weight starts to go up and you get to a point that you can't go any higher, you know what I'm talking about? And you're yelling at your friends, get it, get it, get it, because you're about to die. You have recruited all your motor fibers and you, you can't recruit anymore. So you are going to recruit and activate the smallest number first. And then you're going to activate more and you're going to activate more until you have either accomplished the task or your muscles have failed because you ran out of fibers to recruit. And that's called the human size principle. You recruit the smallest you need first, and then you bring in more as the need arises, or as the burden in this case is bigger. Now, since there are so many muscle fibers working together, you can think of it in a couple of different ways. You can think of muscles working like, um, you know, the big Roman ships that they had with all the guys doing the oars, you know, and the guy beating the drum, you know, and they're all rowing together. You might think of muscles as all rowing together. That's not really the case. I want you to think of muscles like a tug of war. Have you ever done tug of war? Maybe when you were a little kid? you got a certain number of people, and they're all pulling in the same direction. But if you really are going to win at tug-of-war, you're not just pulling. There's going to be a time where you're either going to have to let go and get a new grip so you can pull further, or you're going to have to move your feet back. Now, if we're like the Romans and our, our oarsmen, if our tug-of-war people, if we all release to get a new grip at the same time, what's going to happen? That rope's gone. So in a good team of tug-of-war, you're going to alternate who releases and gets a new grip. But it's going to be seamless. You're not going to lose any strength or action by alternating. And that's what's happening with the muscles. They're alternating when they contract, when they relax. But it happens in such a smooth way by nerves firing and causing this contraction, that this smoothness is called tetanus or tetaning. It's this seamless movement in motion. And we can basically look at it by artificially activating muscles. You ever seen those guys that have the electrodes put on and they're given electric shock and, you know, what, uh, what was that movie, The Right Stuff about the astronauts? When they went through all the testing, they went through that test where there was like, until they were just gripping. They couldn't open their wrist. I mean, they couldn't open their fist. Well, that's what's happening. Initially, when you get five shocks per second, your muscles are able to contract and relax. Ten shocks per second, and you can kind of, kind of see it a little bit, but it's almost like a quiver. Sixty shocks per second, nothing's moving until you've exhausted or that muscle has failed and, you know, then you start to see a little bit of motion. But that is tetany, just that constant, flat, smooth contraction that's happening. Even though the muscle fibers, are, some are firing at different times and different rates, it's just smooth and seamless in its appearance. Now, when we think of that, this is where we, we uh, maybe are familiar with the terms isometric and isotonic. Here, isotonic, we're not talking about solutions with ions and, and solutes. In this case, isotonic, same strength or tone, which relates to tetany, isometric, same length. It's referring to the muscle. So with an isotonic movement, there's a weight on the floor, a big, you know, barbell, okay? You're going to do a curl. When you pick up that weight, you apply a force to it. Now, at first, the weight's not going to move even though you're applying a force. And that initial, when you hit it with your muscles and it doesn't move, you're increasing the tension, but the length, 
metric meter of that muscle isn't shortening. So at first, that's an isometric type of movement. But once the stress you're putting on your muscles exceeds that weight and that weight starts to move, now your muscle is shortening, but the tension, the strength you're applying is the same. So now it becomes isotonic. Now, you may have done the cool little thing where you stand in the doorway and you push your arms against the frame of the door. You're applying a force, you're pushing as hard as you can, but your muscles aren't moving. That is a form of isometric exercise as well. Has anyone ever done that before? The cool part is, if you push against that door and push against that frame and push against that frame, when you can't do it anymore, step away and your arms will just magically, it's like they float up. I promise, it works. But that's metric. Muscles not shortening, but you're pushing with increasing strength. Isotonic, your muscles are shortening, but you're, you're doing the same strength. Because the hardest part of curl is getting it started. Once you get it started, it's coming up. And once you get past a certain point, it gets even a little bit easier as you bring it in. Okay? That all relates to how your muscles are able to do a certain amount of work. And again, this is just showing the velocity of that muscle shortening and the force uh, that you're applying is increasing. If there's no weight whatsoever, you can do that fast. Woo, boy, I can curl nothing all day long. Yeah. But you, you get up to considerable weight, the velocity is going to be zero because, ugh, okay, 100 pounds, that's, I probably wouldn't even pick that up. But it's not going anywhere. You're at zero velocity. So the velocity of movement is going to be essentially inversely proportional to the amount of force it's going to take for that muscle to accomplish that job. <clears throat> now, Whenever you see bodybuilders, and they've got these muscles upon muscles upon muscles, they do not have more muscle cells than before they started working out. The muscle cells they have simply have more of the contractile fibers within them, and the muscle cells are bigger. That's the hypertrophy above growth that happens as your muscles get bigger. Now, I'm not a good example of that. I'm, I'm a good example of this one, atrophy. Because if you don't do activity, your muscles are going to get smaller. You don't lose numbers of cells. It's just your body says, look, muscles take a lot of work to maintain, and if you're not going to use them, we're not just going to keep them there and have to take care of them every day. So they begin to atrophy very, very quickly if they're not used. Astronauts, it happens to them in space. They've, they've got to exercise a couple of hours a day. Uh, they'll get on a treadmill that has these big bungee cords pulling them down to simulate gravity, and they'll have to run on these bungee corded treadmills, maybe upside down on a roof or something. It's really freaky how they do that. But to try to keep their muscles from atrophying, because there's no gravity, so even the, the amount of muscle tone that we have because of gravity, they're not even getting. Now, we, we talked a little bit about how, how muscles work, the organization of muscles as organs, how they're involved and they attach to bones and the connected tissue. But now we're going to look more down at the cellular molecular level and really understand the mechanics of, of contraction. And as we do that, we're going to start with skeletal muscle. That's going to be our, our, our prime model for how muscles do their thing. We've already talked about how nerves stimulate skeletal muscles to contract. You know, we've got that motor in plate, that synapse that we looked at as our typical connection between a presynaptic membrane and a postsynaptic membrane. So it's a nice transition right into this, uh, this type of tissue. Now, skeletal muscles are going to be long, cables. They, they're non-branched, and they basically form during development by a number of muscle precursor cells that fuse together. And so that's why they are multinucleated. Now these long multinucleated cables are absolutely filled to the brim with proteins that are going to slide across one another to cause that muscle to shorten. 
And those are going to be myofibrils. Now, since these cells are packed with myofibrils, there's really no room for the nuclei, so the nuclei get squeezed out to the periphery. So these long cables filled with myofibrils have squeezed all of these multiple nuclei to the periphery. That is your typical appearance of skeletal muscle. Now the other very important identifying characteristic of skeletal muscle is this striped pattern. Now, it's not easy enough for scientists just to say this is striped. They have to invent a big fancy word for striped, and that's why you see striated. And the striated pattern, this alternating pattern of light and dark bands, is going to be dependent on the amount of overlap of the two proteins that we're going to talk about that make up the myofibrils. Myosin and actin, those are our two engines that are going to drive muscle contraction. And that repeated and synchronous overlap is going to give us this banding pattern. Now, we see at this light level look, we see light and dark bands. We're going to define those down into a couple of more subdivisions other than just light and dark to get really at the organization of skeletal muscle. So this is kind of what we saw on this previous slide. Okay, if you can look at this striped pattern. We've got this dark band, a light band, dark band, light band, dark band. But you can see how that dark band can be divided up into additional regions. Some are a little bit lighter and some are a little bit darker than others. And again, here you can see how these myofibrils are going to overlap to basically give us these alternating patterns. Now, when we look at this alternating pattern of light, dark, light, dark, light, dark, we define a functional unit of the muscle. And we're going to start in the center of this light band, and we're going to go from the center of this light band to the center of this light band, and that distance, that unit, is going to comprise that functional repeating unit that we're going to use, and we call it a sarcomere. Sarco means muscle. What's another prefix that means a muscle? Myo. Myo, sarco are two prefixes that mean muscle. How many people have had comparative anatomy? Okay, you know the, the repeating segments of lamprey muscle and shark muscle. What do we call those? Myo, myomeres. So again, we've got those same segments, except we don't call them myomeres, sarcomeres. One is more of a gross anatomical whole muscle, this is a microscopic level myofibril. That's why we use two different terms. So a sarcomere is going to exist from this region, and you can already see we've labeled this a Z-line to a Z-line, and we'll define what that is in a moment, but that's the sarcomere. A sarcomere is going to contain both of these myofibrils, actin and myosin. And go ahead and get used to associating thick, that term with myosin, and thin with actin. It's going to help you as we go through the molecular organization of, of each of these to have those terminologies already in your mind. Now, this is a transmission electron micrograph looking at the myofibrils of muscle. And here we can see the dark band, and here we can see the light band, but you see additional patterns. So in the center of this light band, we see this line, and that is our Z line. And over here we see the next light band with its Z line. And then here is our dark band, and we're going to define two other regions within that dark band as we look at what comprises a sarcomere. But this little diagram down at the bottom, this is an illustration of what happens to these myofibrils during a muscle contraction. Now, this is going to be from this point to this point is a sarcomere, there's another sarcomere, there's another sarcomere. And the way they're all arranged in this series, I think you can imagine when one sarcomere slides their myofibrils together, when they're attached to the other 
sarcomere, and again, and again, and again. These small microscopic contractions are going to be greatly expanded so that you're shortening the whole muscle by centimeters. Whereas each sarcomere is shortening only just a couple of angstroms. But it adds up because you have so many of these together. So let's look at the bands. The dark bands of the sarcomere are called the A bands for anisotropic. Isotropic, I guess iso being the same, tropic meaning, in this case, light. Basically, isotropic bands are going to let light pass through fairly easily. And that's what we're going to call the light band that we're going to see in a few minutes. Anytime you put the prefix of a or an in front of a word, what are you going to do to that word? It means not. So if isotropic means light can pass through, and isotropic is going to be what? Light doesn't pass through, and it gives it the dark appearance. And what is preventing the light from getting through is the fact that in this band, you have both the actin and the myosin where they're overlapped, which is going to prevent any light from getting through as much. So it gives it a darker appearance. Now, in the center of that dark band, okay, here is our A band, the anisotropic band. It extends from here to this point. When you look at the center, you can see there's a little bit of a lighter region right in here as opposed to the periphery. And this is going to be the H band. You can look down here. So the H band is only going to consist of myosin. Actin is not overlapping the H band at this point. So it's a little bit lighter, but it's still pretty dark. Because myosin is the thickest of the filaments. Now, in the very center of the H band, we have a little bit darker line that goes right down the middle. And that darker line is called the M line or the M band because in addition to myosin, it has some structural molecules such as myomycin is one of them. And since, again, you have more stuff, it's going to be a little bit darker than the surrounding area of the H band. Okay? So we've got the big A band, dark, acting in myosin. In the center of the A-band, we have this lighter zone, which is the H, it's only myosin. But then the very middle of the H, which is also the middle of the A-band, it's a little bit darker line because you've got extra structural molecules, myomycin being one of them, in addition to myosin. Okay, that's the A-band. The I-band, isotropic, light can pass through, get that lighter color. And you might predict it already, the reason more light can get through is you only have actin. So the I band is going to be even lighter than just the H, which is myosin, because myosin is thicker. That's why I want you to use those myosin thick, actin thin. Go ahead and always associate those two together. And we've already seen in the center of the I band, we have this dark Z line. And again, it's dark because we have a lot of structural molecules that are going to anchor actin into this one point, you can almost think of the Z line as being the origin of the muscle. It's not really going to move. You're going to have this relative shortening, but where the shortening is taking place is more here in the H band and the M line. And we'll see how that shortening is actually occurring. Again, a transmission electron micrograph, we've got the I band, Z line, a band from point to point, H band, and then the M line right down the middle. Now what they tried to illustrate is if you look at this, in, in this picture you've got these myofibrils running in this direction and you're looking at them from the side. So that's why you see this long appearance. But if you were to take these long fibers, like you know the spaghetti that you have in a package, Instead of looking at the spaghetti from the sideways, if you turned it at the end, all you would see were all these little dots 
just the cut ends of the spaghetti. So if we make a cut through the Z line and just looked at the ends, we're just going to see these little skinny dots. And here in the H band, if we make a cut right through here, we're going to see these thicker dots. Now, just from what we know so far, even if we haven't talked about who's what and where, if you just know actin, thin, myosin, thick, what are these dots compared to this? These are actin, thin. You can see how skinny they are. These are myosin. They're much thicker. Now, when we get out to this part of the A band, now this is where you can see the overlap. And do you see how regularly arranged the actin surrounding the myosin, do you see how regularly arranged they are? There are a lot of structural proteins that are helping hold them and register as they slide across each other. So largely looking at real high-powered microscopes like this has enabled us to define which molecules are in which place relative to this repeating uh, striped pattern in skeletal muscle.